Hey everybody, this is Gregory from Adapt University. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about non-fungible tokens or NFTs. I'm going to explain what they are and what you can do with them. And I'm also going to kind of walk you through uh, some of the code that uh, you know governs the standards for how you build non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Uh, and also you know, a couple tips and tricks uh, about what to do when you're building those kinds of things. So before we do that, be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the like button down below. That really helps these videos get found so that more people can learn how to build blockchain technology. So what are non-fungible tokens? Well, let's look at an example to understand what a non-fungible token is from a conceptual level. Uh, let's look at, you know, probably one of the most famous non-fungible token out there, which is, you know, CryptoKitties. So if you're not familiar with CryptoKitties, it's a basically a digital collectible um, that exists on the blockchain. So if you go to CryptoKitties website, like I've got here, you can basically collect and breed digital cats, kind of like a game. So if you have cryptocurrency, you can purchase a kitty through a marketplace and you know you can breed new kitties uh, to make you know new ones. And what the technology is actually behind this is a token. And you say it's a token, how does that make sense? You know, I'm thinking of, you might be thinking of ERC20 tokens, like other Ethereum based tokens, um, but they work differently. So let's look at an example of a different Ethereum token like you know cryptocurrency so if you're familiar with other ethereum based tokens like let's find one here on coin market cap like zero x or omg um you know zero x is a token on ethereum so it's a digital asset but it doesn't work like a collectible cat does so what's the difference well in we should look at the name non-fungible token and explain what that means so if a CryptoKitty is a non-fungible token, then a regular Ethereum-based ERC-20 token is a fungible token. Now, what does that mean? Well, a fungible token basically is like, like 0x or any kind of ERC-20 token is a token where, you know, if, if, if you have one 0x token and I have one 0x token, we can trade them for one another and there's no difference in value. We know that uh, each 0x token is worth the same as every other 0x token. They're interchangeable or they're fungible. That's what fungible means. So it basically means that I could swap 0x token for any other 0x token and it'd be fine. There wouldn't be any disagreement on how much each one is worth in terms of 0x. Now, maybe for a different um you know crypto asset if you want to change it for a different type of token you know there might be some disagreement on price but that's kind of what you know that's what an exchange is for to make markets on those kinds of things um so that's what a fungible token is so a non-fungible token is different because whenever i if you look at crypto kitties right we can't all agree necessarily on what each individual kitty is worth I can't necessarily just swap, you know, one kitty for another. So if you go to the CryptoKitties website, you'll see that like each, you know, cat uh, has, you know, a different price. That's what, you know, fungibility is. And each cat has its own identity. Um, a lot of people will compare this to like baseball cards or, you know, if you have Pokemon cards or something like that, you know, each card has a different character or player on it, and because it's different, the value of that card is uh, kind of up for debate relative to the other cards in the deck. Um, that's what a fungible token is. That's kind of how they work. Sorry, a non-fungible token. So a Ethereum-based token where you know I have a total supply of uh, 0x tokens. doesn't matter which 0x token I give you. But if I have a, an entire supply of CryptoKitties, it does matter which one I give you because, you know, one might be worth more than the other. Like one CryptoKitty might be rare. So in a 0x token, you can't guarantee that like one token is going to be rare. It just doesn't work that way. So um, let's take a look at, you know, how the actual technology works in order to make a non-fungible token. So 
Uh, both types of tokens are powered by smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain. So there's you know some code that's deployed to the blockchain that uh, governs how um, the asset works. So this, these both operate on a standard. So they're fungible tokens work on what's called the ERC-20 standard, hence ERC-20 tokens. And non-fungible tokens work off the ERC-721 standard, which is a standard that uh, implements an interface that the token, you know, must have in order to be, you know, traded uh, with other, you know, systems that might want to use this token or hold it or exchange it, things like that. So in the case of like ERC-20 tokens, you want to have a set standard so that your token can be like, you know, used, uh, it can be traded on cryptocurrency exchanges or like used in uh, an app that uses tokens uh, or just reliably sent back and forth between wallets. Similarly, you want a digital asset, a, a non-fungible token to have a standard interface that it can be like held in wallets, um, you know, so that it can be sold in marketplaces, stuff like that, or anything that we want to use NFTs for, and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of this video, like what all you can do with them besides just, you know, creating collectibles. So let's go look at uh, some of the code for Ethereum-based NFT or non-fungible token. So right now I've got the, uh, e the ERC-721 um, standard, the proposal for it. So this is in the Ethereum Ethereum Improvement Proposals Repository on GitHub. This is where you can see be people basically, you know, submitting, um, you know, standards for Ethereum. And uh, if we just browse through this, it kind of goes over a lot of what I talked about. But you can actually look at the interface here. So we can see there are a lot of, uh, if you're familiar with the ERC-20 standard, there's some functions in here that look familiar. We can see balance of, Basically, this just gets, um, you know, the count for, um, sorry, it gets the count for a user who owns these NFTs. So if this were the CryptoKitties contract, um, and I used to call the balance of function and pass my own address, and it would tell me how many CryptoKitties I owned, like how many total from this smart contract that were issued by the smart contract. Um, also, so when you're using, when you're implementing a ERC-20 standard, each token's gonna have an ID. That's what's fundamentally different about an NFT is that each token has an ID. I probably should have said that earlier. That's a lot simpler of an explanation. Um, but if you look at the code here, basically I could call a function owner of and then pass in the token ID and it'll tell me uh, who the owner is. So if, if I do that and it's my token, it'll return my Ethereum address. And you know, we can basically internally, if you're going to do this, you can, you need to implement some sort of storage inside your smart contract that holds um, the address of the owner uh, with the token. So if you're going to do this, I would just recommend having like a mapping internally where basically the key would be the token ID and the value would be the address. So some other functions in here basically govern, you know, transferring these assets. So there's a transfer from function, and safe transfer from, you can see some variants on there. You can kind of browse through those more if you want to. Um, but basically transfer from kind of works a lot like the ERC-20 transfer function, where it basically you give it a from address, you know, the person that the assets are coming from, who owns the asset, and the to address, you know, who it's going to, and you actually pass the ID of the token you want to transfer. Um, so the next thing that you want, and, and that can be used, you know, to uh, basically transfer tokens that you own um, or have someone else who's approved to transfer it, transfer them. So that, that goes into the next uh, little bit of functionality, which is actually approving other people to transfer the assets for you. So what does that mean? So for example, if I want to you know, sell a non-fungible token at a marketplace, like say I own a crypto kitty and I want to put it up for auction, um, then I, I can assign the token to a smart contract that's able to sell it for me. And when I do that, I need to actually approve um, the, I need to approve the smart contract to be able to make that transfer for me. And then I can also, um, approve it to do 
and that and so that first time when I do, uh, you know, uh, approve the smart contract to do it, I approve it for an individual specific token. I actually give it a token ID. But I can also say, hey, you're just you can you can approve to transfer all of my tokens, right? If you want to sell them, you can sell them all, or something like that. There's you know other use cases, but that's a good example. So the last uh, few functions in here are basically like, you know, we can see uh, is this I you know, get, get the uh, approved address. Um, and then you can also see like if an address is approved for everything. Um, so another little tip in here is how you can kind of take these smart contracts to the next level. And this is something that I've known from experience in building uh, ERC-721 contracts, which is the metadata. So, and this is important if you're gonna build something like a crypto collectible that has uh, a, you know, an image representation like a crypto kitty, where you, know, you see an image that represents your token. So basically we could store, um, you don't wanna store that on the blockchain. You don't want you know, an image of a crypto kitty. You don't want an SVG. You don't want really any too much data on the blockchain as a general rule. Um, and you don't want, you know, something, you don't, you don't really want to rebuild the image of a kitty with data from the blockchain directly. So a way around that is to actually use uh, some metadata for your token. And you can do that by basically send, t taking a, uh, assigning it a URL. So if you look down here, this function says token URI. So what that does is basically you can pass in the token ID and it'll return a string for you, which will be the URI or URL, you know, this is basically the link that identifies where you can fetch all the metadata for that individual token. So you can have a web server somewhere off chain or separate from the blockchain that basically just returns the information about that token to, you know, um, build the visual representation or just some other metadata that you want to. You know, if you look, scroll down more for the standard, you can see a uh, basic JSON object that might get returned from an API or something like that that would give you information about this token and about its metadata and how you could generate, you know, maybe a visual representation or something like that. You can see right here, you know, name, description, image. And that's what you do. You just have like a JSON API somewhere where you could just you know pull that data and it would just build it for you. So that's a really great way to do that. So you're not storing a whole bunch of data on chain, which would be really slow and be expensive. Um, so I would highly recommend using an ERC721 smart contract that has metadata capabilities off chain. All right, so um, that's what I wanted to show you and about this code, about how you might kind of go about implementing something like this. Um, I'm thinking about maybe doing some more videos by ERC721, like live coding uh, or building a project with that, kind of based on if you are interested. If you are, leave a comment below just so that I know. Um, so last, I want to talk about, you know, what else can you do with ERC721 and non-fungible tokens? Well, that's a good question, and that's kind of a question everyone's trying to answer. Um, you know, there's a lot of crypto collectible projects out there. You know, if you look on any of the, uh, like, um, you know, DAP discovery websites, you'll see a lot of crypto games on there, and they use ERC721. Um, you know, people are talking about using these kinds of things for in-game items, for video games. They're talking about using them for like software licenses. They're talking about using them for like certificates of authenticity for project, sorry, for products and things like that. Um, there's all kinds of things. So I would, I would encourage you to kind of use your imagination and use your creativity to think about what you could create with a non-fungible token, like what that technology is good for. Um, and if you think of anything, you know, show me what you got. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to wrap up there today, guys. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy this video. If you have any more questions, leave a comment down below. And also let me know if you're interested in seeing videos about building non-fungible tokens. 
So be sure to also subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the like button below. Like I said, that really helps these videos get found so that more people can learn how to build blockchain technology. And until next time, thanks for watching DAP University.